Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. Father, tonight we come before you thanking you for the many blessings you have bestowed on us, your children. Thank you for the beauty of the earth which you have created as a dwelling place for us, your children. Father, you have protected us, protected us all our lives from all harm and danger, and so we come before you to celebrate your mighty acts. Father, we ask your forgiveness for the sins we have committed by word, thought, and deed. Blot our sins, dear God, and forgive us from all unworthiness. Use us as your vessels through which your love and mercy flow, and help us by our living to win souls for you. Father, I thank you for all your children who are represented here tonight. Fill your ministering servant with your Holy Spirit, that he will speak the message you have laid on his heart, and that it will go forth with clarity that souls would be won for thy kingdom. Father, we bring before you the youth tonight, praying that you will empty them of self and fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they may be drawn to you. For they are the ones to carry on the ministry when we older ones have departed this world. And now, Father, I pray that you will cover us with your blood and help us to go forth as shining lights to bring souls for your kingdom. This I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Bible reading will be taken from Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. Would be followers of Jesus. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the ear have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my house. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of Christ. Sisters and brothers, I'm taking the text of my meditation from Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are a rock and our salvation. Amen. My sisters and brothers, as we prepare ourselves to face the start of a new church year, it is always prudent to pause and reflect on the call that the Lord God, through his Son Jesus Christ, has placed on us all. Many persons are often minded to think that such a call has only been made to ordain ministers and lay preachers. But may I remind you that since the Methodist Church believes in the priesthood of all believers, then all of us have a shared responsibility in the service of God 
and in fulfilling the mission of Christ. The call is therefore for all. The portion of scripture read this evening gives us some insight into what it takes to be true followers of Jesus. In the verses which went before our focal text, we see examples of persons not being fit for the kingdom of God by pronouncing judgments on themselves by way of the excuses which they made. Their responses disqualify them to some extent, unless some divine intervention determine otherwise as God seeks to work his purpose out. In this verse 62, we find Jesus using a common agricultural implement to make a point. That implement is a plow. My friends, at this stage, I want you to understand that the plow is still with us and is still an important piece of equipment for our very survival. It may have changed in prototype from being a crude animal drawn instrument to being a modern mechanized piece of machinery with more capabilities, but its function has not changed. It is on that basis of being still relevant in function on today's mission field that I wish to speak to you on the plow and the plowman. In this regard, I will be looking at the following three areas. The purpose of the plow, the position of the plowman, and the potential of the plow. My sisters and brothers, if you are seeking a job as a machine operator, you must first get to know how it works and its purpose. The same goes for a plow. You must first know its purpose, which entails knowing its parts as well as its power, for it is a tool which is results-oriented. It is nothing to be toyed with or to be taken lightly. In agriculture, the plow is an instrument for turning up, breaking and preparing the ground for receiving the seed. It is drawn by oxen or horses and saves the labor of digging. It is therefore a most useful instrument in agriculture. And that Explanation comes from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. In the spiritual sense, I regard the plow to be the Bible, the sacred and spurred word of God given to human race as a chart, a compass, and a companion for our life's journey. Like the agricultural plow, it has parts, power, and purpose. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, we find the following. Indeed, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That verse gives us an idea of the seriousness of what we are dealing with, so that by chance we may not injure ourselves or invoke the wrath of God through its misuse. Also in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, we read, Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Clearly then, the word of God can also serve the same purpose as the plow in breaking up uncultivated ground to receive seed. In fact, where the plow fails, such as when encountering rocks, the hammer, especially a jackhammer, gets the job done. On the other hand, there's also joy and pleasure to be found in the word as it also brings peace and comfort to troubled souls. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, at verse 16, we find the prophet making a very profound statement when he said, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. My friends, 
Knowing the word is one of the foremost and common denominators in the Christian faith. Alongside of that comes being not only hearers, but doers of the word, living the word, teaching and preaching the word. For me, the other common denominators in Christianity are 1. Being saved. 2. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. 3. Having an undying faith. 4. Fervent love. and 5. Possessing an ardent hope. Sisters and brothers, what has become of the plough to which you were entrusted? Secondly, I want us to reflect on the position of the ploughman. When we think of the word position, we refer to a state of being placed, situation, often with reference to other objects, or a manner of standing or being placed, an attitude. In the time of Jesus on this earth, the plough was a common implement seen on the landscape. That was so because people's livelihood depended on it for crop production, food, and work. The plough was then a crude implement made up of a wooden frame with a metal blade, which was harnessed or attached to two animals, mainly oxen, and directed by a ploughman who had to be fit and alert. The reason being is that he had to keep his hand on the plough and he had to keep his gaze on the ground ahead of him so that he could direct the animals into making straight forwards. Otherwise, the results of his work would be seen from afar off as being careless, crooked and confusing. All of these would have been evidence of a lack of concentration and commitment. Furthermore, he had to keep a steady gaze ahead to detect when large stones or obstacles such as pits and dugouts were in the paths of the animals. These were the things that could cause serious injury or maiming of the animals which were yoked together. And any good ploughman could not afford to have lame animals on his hands. That would have put a halt to production, which may have resulted in loss not only of earnings, but of the animals themselves. So the plowman had to be very focused. My friends, so must be the modern day plowman in the church of God. He's in a good place to chart the path for others to follow, such as the sores and the laborers. In this regard, I now want to look at the position of the plowman. He or she must have responded to the call of God. He or she must also be a good planner, so that by looking ahead, areas for growth and development can be detected and pursued. The same goes for any obstacles that may be in the way, so that by prayer and application of the word, the will of God will be revealed and realized. For the plowman is partnering with God. This brings up another related thought. The plowman must be a willing partner. Any reluctance, hesitation, or any actions on his or her part can prove to be deterrents for building up the kingdom of God. I also want to suggest that the plowman must be proficient. Being proficient means being competent or skilled. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, at verse 15, we find this reminder. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Many of us have the kind of talents and skills which can be used in God's service. But we tend to think that we cannot be a plowman. If that is the case, please take note that after the plowman has prepared the ground, there is room for others such as sowers, laborers, reapers, and even gleaners. Not being able to attain to the position of a plowman is no excuse. Again, in the book of 1 Corinthians 3, at verse 6, we find this reminder from the Apostle Paul. 
I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. The position, therefore, of the plowman is not one of pride, of pomp, or pleasure, but one of purpose, performance, and pastoral care. Under the watch of the plowman, the animals harnessed to the plow must not be injured or maimed. Productivity must be realized, and the purposes of God must be fulfilled. Looking back is therefore not an, an option. We saw what looking back did to the wife of Lot as they were leaving Sodom. We must stay focused. Sisters and brothers, in the third and final consideration, I want us to look at the potential of the plow. The word potential means the ability or capacity for development. Most times we do not realize the power of some of the things that are entrusted to us. Moses took for granted the rod he was carrying until God reminded him that he had an instrument of power in his hands and told him to use it by striking the rock from which water then flowed to satisfy the needs of the people. There is more power in the plow than we can imagine, but we take it for granted and perhaps use it as a routine. Many benefits come from its use. In our local context, observe that when the plow is used, the cattle egrets and other birds benefit immediately because they feed on the worms and other bugs which are on earth. Once the plowing is done, the farmer can start sowing seeds and in time reap a bountiful harvest. Even the monkeys we so despise will benefit from some of the produce. You will find that there is an untap energy which we need to utilize. One of these areas is the preparation for planting. If salvation is our primary focus, then the winning of souls for Christ must be a priority. There is much soil around us which need the foreign of the plow. Such ground is being overtaken by thorns and growth of inedible crops. We need to put the plow to work, but we cannot operate it by remote control. I must also touch on the public nature of the plow. In Barbados, we have a saying to the effect that you can hide and buy land, but you cannot hide and work it. My friends, there is also the public nature of the plow. It must be seen to be in operation. It must attract the stares and admiration of those looking on. It must be seen to enhance the environment and so earn the respect of those who will benefit from its operation. It is therefore incumbent upon us to find every opportunity to train upcoming plowmen or women so that the future of the plow will be assured. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, I wish to remind you that in our hands, a tool that has encompassed time and age and will be there until the end of time has proven its worth in the cultivation of sound minds, in the stern of soil for the salvation of souls, in the sustaining of the human race, and in meeting the spiritual needs of people. We have to maintain it. Handle it with care. Use it with confidence that we are being directed by the one who created the very ground which we are seeking to cultivate and with whom we are partnering. The plow is waiting. Let us therefore engage ourselves earnestly to the task ahead, knowing that if we remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding to each other in love, our labors in Christ will not be in vain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
is given, much is required. In your loving kindness, you have given us much more than we deserve. Yet we fail to honor you by returning to you what you expect of us in service and to our fellow human beings through love and charity. Dear God, forgive us for our neglect. Heavenly Father, strengthen our faith so that when we put our hands to the plow, we may not look back, but keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to go forward in your power and in your might as we are guided by your Holy Spirit. Save us from the snares of excuses and expediency. Give us more of your grace to face our daily challenges and continue to bless us and our families. All these things I pray to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our daily devotion. We trust it has been a blessing to you. Now together, let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly.